This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Tableau Software and Dole Food Company. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome members of our armed forces who are joining us today and new listeners in the Atlanta and New York areas. Thank you for being with us again. In just a moment, we're going to tackle a difficult subject which has divided our nation, the legal definition of what constitutes torture, and whether the CIA stepped over the line in using questionable interrogation techniques which have been brought to light in the 6,000-page Senate Intelligence Committee report. Former Deputy Assistant Attorney General, a man at the center of the controversy, Mr. John Yu, will be joining us to try to help us understand the definition of torture and whether the report is completely accurate. But before Mr. Yu joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. John Chun Yu was born in Seoul, South Korea. He immigrated to the U.S. as a child and grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Yu earned his undergraduate degree in history and law degree from Harvard University. He clerked for Judge Lawrence H. Silberman on the U.S. Court of Appeals of the District of Columbia Circuit and Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Yu began teaching law at the University of California at Berkeley in 1993 and served as general counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee from 1995 to 96. In 2001, Yu was appointed Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Bush administration, where he served under Attorney General John Ashcroft. It was during this period that Yu authored several legal opinions, which included the use of, quote, enhanced interrogation techniques during wartime, as well as the president's authority to conduct warrantless wiretapping. Yu is the author of five books and also the recipient of the Federalist Society Bader Award. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report legal scholar, author, and former Deputy Assistant Attorney General, John Yu. Welcome to the program, Mr. Yu. Rebecca, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to join you. I'm so happy to speak to you. Um, You know, recently, after reviewing more than six million documents for five years, the Senate Intelligence Committee made portions of its report on CIA torture public. And it was pretty clear that your legal opinions were taken too far. So to open today's program, I'd like to start with a basic question. According to the law, what exactly is the definition of torture? Well, first, when we say the law, we mean an act passed by Congress to implement a treaty that we signed called the Convention Against Torture. And in the statute, Congress defined torture as the specific intent to cause severe pain and suffering. And the problem is that the statute doesn't go in any, really any other detail to talk about actual interrogation methods and whether they're overline or are okay. And so that's the task we had at the Justice Department when I was there in the very first few months after the 9-11 attacks, our uh, intelligence agencies, I think, uh, were very successful in capturing the top leaders of al-Qaeda who were not going to cooperate, were not going to speak at all, they were not going to, uh, they were not going to answer questions in a normal police interrogation setting. You know, I think one of them said, uh, I'll see you in New York. Uh, you know, they, they have no intention of cooperating. And so the question came is, what uh, would the CIA be allowed to do to interrogate the very top leaders of al-Qaeda, who we thought, this is just a few months after the 9-11 tax, we thought had plans for more attacks on the country, but without violating that law. And so we had to go through and review, one by one, each of these uh, proposals by the CIA and make sure that they didn't step over the line that Congress set in the statute. Now, most of us are not lawyers, so just to clarify. Thank, thank God. Thank God for that. <laughs> well, well, the fact is we get confused. We're looking at a 6,000-page document, and we think, well, how do we even make heads or tails out of this? Now, uh, given that we're not lawyers, uh, many experts claim that the Constitution's Eighth Amendment, which prevents the government from engaging in cruel and unusual punishment, extended to torture— uh, and and military interrogation abroad, but you you disagreed with that opinion, is that right? 
Yes, first let me say about the report. Uh, you know, you make a good point. The report is very critical of the CIA. It, it gives the impression that despite whatever we said in the Justice Department, that there were CIA agents out in the field who were uh, essentially freelancing things on their own and uh, abusing prisoners going well beyond any authority they had and that the president didn't know about it and top leaders didn't know about it. We didn't know about the Justice Department. The problem with that report that I think makes it a deeply flawed report is that it didn't interview any of the people who were directly involved with the program. I, I was not interviewed. I don't, I'm pretty sure from what I've read that uh, none of the major uh, administration people were interviewed, including uh, you know, top CIA officials. So this is, this is, you know, as a lawyer, you don't have to be a lawyer to understand that at least when you want to have a full and fair report, you should hear from both sides, but most particularly the witnesses, the people who were there. My understanding so I, is there were no in-person uh, interviews. Yeah, this is a terror. So this is, I think that that just turned the report into a flawed enterprise from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, we would never allow something like this you know, any kind of investigation that the Justice Department would do, for example, or even your, you know, you know, you know the district attorney down the street from you in, in your county or town. It's just, I think, a fundamental problem is, is it violates the, the, I think, the idea that you want to have all the information fully out there first before you analyze it and before you say someone did something right, someone did something wrong. And so I don't think that 6,000, no matter how long the report is, I don't think it can be trusted for that reason. And then I also think it was wrong. Even based on what I saw, this was not a group of rogue CIA agents. This was a program, very, as you said at the beginning of the show, difficult question. I wish we didn't have to answer it, but the 9-11 attacks and al-Qaeda forced us to have to answer this kind of question. And I think that it went up the chain of command all the way up to the president and was carefully reviewed, discussed, and decided all the way up at the top. And so this idea that you know there were these rogue CIA agents out there doing things without anyone knowing, I don't think is actually true based on what I what I knew from my time in the government. Well, now looking at what the Senate Intelligence Committee's report said, is there any part of you that feels that your legal opinions were taken too far by the CIA? I can't tell because I'm not sure whether what's in the report is true or not. Yeah, I'm that's, sure a, that's if we a actually, problem. You don't yeah, know the actually, veracity of what's been reported. Yeah, I mean, I you know, from what I've seen in other accounts, you know, I think that the CIA was trying very carefully to obey the things we set out in the memo, that this is important. The thing that strikes struck me, and I think most Americans don't know about how the CIA operates, is that it's very concerned about acting legally. There's a, the CIA has a general counsel's office with uh, over 100 lawyers in it, and they're really worried about making sure they're complying with the law and staying uh, in tune with the political leaders in both the executive branch and in Congress, they don't want to. They don't want to be the people who get sent out to, uh, you know, take on dangerous missions, and they get and then then get sold out. You know, get thrown under the bus sure. when everything. Sure, but I believe happened to them before. <laughs> yes, but I believe you've gone public as saying that uh, if some of the things that are in the report, such as the rectal feeding. Uh, and uh, hydration activities and uh, and the having to remove someone's eye because it was so da- badly ba- damaged uh, from beatings if those things are in fact true that they have that they went in fact too far yeah I guess you know so I was on a show and they said oh well the report says some of these things might have happened and, I said, and I'm not sure if they did or not if they did, they are outside the authorization we gave at the Justice Department. Yes, we gave a, and those should be a, prosecuted if they are outside of the authorization. Yeah, depending on what really happened. Yes, <laughs> that's the problem. And that I is the question. The question oh, yeah, is what really happened. Yeah, and, now, and I, now, I understand yeah. that. Yeah, what I will say though on that is that two different teams of prosecutors at the Justice Department looked into this and chose not to bring any charges. Yes, that's true. And we're going to ta- have to take our first break. When we come back, we're going to talk about what the Senate's report revealed about the treatment of detainees at Guantanamo. You're listening to the Costa Report. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. 
Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. Have you checked out the Costa Report blog yet? Well, what are you waiting for? There's no quicker way to find out what newsmakers are saying than the Costa Report blog at RebeccaCosta.com. It's where the former CEO of Apple and PepsiCo, John Scully, predicts where the next tech breakthroughs are going to come from. And also where Trent Lott explains why a GOP reversal of the Senate nuclear option will signal real change in our nation's capital. And the Costa Report blog is where you'll discover why Alan Dershowitz is worried that ISIS is adopting Hamas-like tactics. You'll find all this and more at the Costa Report blog. A new blog is posted every week, and they're short, pithy, and tell the unvarnished truth. Just go to RebeccaCosta.com to get the latest blog. That's RebeccaCosta.com. And while you're there, be sure to register for updates and breaking news. The Costa Report blog, bringing you the news the big networks don't and won't. Is your internet connection slow? Do you experience outages or dread calling customer support? How about your latency? Etheric Networks can help you. Etheric Networks is the Bay Area's locally owned alternative to DSL, satellite, and cable. Etheric provides fast, reliable, symmetric internet via our wholly owned network of towers covering the Bay Area from Salinas to Santa Cruz to Sausalito. We install a two-foot dish on your building and point it to one of our towers to connect you directly to the major data centers of Silicon Valley. Etheric directly connects to Tier 1 companies like Google, Facebook, and Amazon to ensure high-quality service from your building to the world. KSCO Business Special. Business service up to 10 megabits per second symmetric for as little as $299 a month with a $399 installation fee. Etheric also offers high-end 100 megabit and even gigabit and 10 gigabit service starting at $599 a month with installation starting from $500. Etheric Networks. Call 650-399-4200. Etheric.net. That's E-T-H-E-R-I-C dot net. There's a man named Dr. Joel Wallach who is anything but your typical doctor, both a veterinarian and naturopathic physician. Doc asks, why does the United States spend more money on health care by far and still rank 50th in health and longevity worldwide? He believes that people should empower themselves with a basic understanding of nutrition, take charge of their health and attain optimal health and longevity through nutrition, not by toxic prescription drugs that lead to side effects and more toxic prescription drugs. Drugs. Doc Wallach's message is resonating with an increasing number of Americans who are waking up to all the big government, big pharma, and big insurance manipulation of our health care system. I'm George Norrie, and I like what Doc Wallach is saying and doing to enlighten people about health care. Visit kscohealth.com and listen to Doc Wallach's Deadly Recipes lecture. Makes a lot of sense, and I urge you to join our team. Go to kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is former Deputy Assistant Attorney General, Mr. John Yu. And before the break, you were saying that if some of the extreme torture expressed in the Senate's report is true, then these interrogations step outside of the law. Uh, but that the trouble is that there were no actual interviews done with those who performed the torture or even their victims. So there really is no confirmation of many of the conclusions that the report draws. Is that right? If they were uh, saying that anyone did commit torture in any of these episodes, who knows? But if they were uh, using interrogation methods that we did not approve in the Justice Department, then they're you know, legally at risk. But, you know, I do take the word of uh, the two different teams of prosecutors, one under the Bush administration and one under the Obama administration. 
even though it's an unprecedented step uh, to even re-examine the first team's look at it, but two different teams of uh, civil service, you know, career prosecutors with no sort of partisan interest in this at all, looked at all these cases, looked at the exact same things the Senate uh, committee did and found that no one, uh, that, that there are about to be no cases brought against any of the CIA agents. I'd rather, I, you know, take their word above it over a Senate committee in which no Republicans staff participated and no one was interviewed who were witnesses and no one got a chance to respond to see the report and respond to it before Mm -hmm. it was released. Mm -hmm. So we're going to move on here. We started the program today with getting clarification on what torture is and is not. So now let's talk about another term which seemed to be creating a lot of controversy after 9-11, the term enemy combatant. Uh, when our enemies used to wear military uniforms and they were part of a foreign government's military, they, they were fairly easy to identify. But it, it's much more difficult when that enemy's a shopkeeper by day and a bomb maker by night. I think you, you really hit, I think, on the central difficulty about the war that we've been fighting since 9-11. And our country, as you said at the beginning, is split on this. And for understandable reasons, I don't think anyone's being unreasonable by... Uh, being concerned about it or confused about it or, or taking the opposite view, and that is, is this really a war at all? You know, we're used to, as you said, fighting wars against people who are wearing the uniforms of the militaries of other countries, and we fight them on battlefields. Or is this something that's more like crime, right, where people don't wear uniforms, they're not on operating on behalf of a state? Um, the way I think of it is, that these people are fighting a war against us, and they're doing it by violating all the rules of civilized warfare, which, you know, the reasons we make people wear uniforms who are fighting is so they don't get confused with civilians. And you're not supposed to disguise yourself as a civilian and attack civilians. That's the core idea of uh, millennia of development of the rules of war. If you think about how al-Qaeda operates and other terrorist groups, they operate by violating that fundamental principle, by gaining an advantage from attacking civilians by surprise and pretending to be civilians. I don't think we should uh, fight this war and give them an advantage for choosing to cheat like that. I think, in fact, if it means anything, we should be tougher on them uh, and than we would be on a normal military wearing uniforms and fighting by the conventional rules, because these guys in al-Qaeda or ISIS or whatever, they're, they're, they are cheating. They're trying to blur the lines between fighters and civilians. And they're trying to undermine thousands of years of the development of the rules of civilized warfare in the process. But but clearly, if we don't call them an enemy combatant, we don't know how to treat them. Yes. Well, I think that, I mean, there are enemy combatants of different kinds. So you know, anybody we're fighting in a war is an enemy combatant. And then there are people who fight according to the rules. And those are the people who should get the Geneva Convention's protections, in my view. And we call them prisoners of war, and they, you know, they get housed in prison war camps, and so on. They have certain rights. And so. But then there are people who fight against us, who are enemy combatants too, but they don't follow the rules. And we, you know, pirates are an example of this. Uh, people who fight without uniforms on are examples. And I think terrorists are an example of this. Are terrorists just criminals, or are they enemy combatants? See, I think they're enemy combatants, but I think a lot of people in the in the country and worldwide, some you know maybe not a majority of people, but a, a lot of people think they might just be criminals. I think this is the view in Europe, for example. A lot of European countries think of terrorists more as criminals, and, and I think for a long time we did too. I think in the United States until 9/11, White House's administrations of both political parties did not think of terrorism as a military matter. I think on 9-11, that's why 9-11 is significant, is because I think terrorist groups crossed the line. They t- undertook an attack on our country that only nations in the past could have. In fact, many nations in the world couldn't carry out the 9-11 attack. So do you believe it was the scale of the attack? Yes, exactly. I think that when a group crosses a line and starts inflicting destruction and death on a level like that, they are... Uh, becoming an enemy, and it becomes a war. It's not just a uh, large uh, police response to uh, broad crime. Mm -hmm. And how about the detainees at Guantanamo? Are they criminals, or are they enemy combatants, or is there a mix? Yeah, exactly. So this all, everything, all these questions about uh, 
our post-9-11 response really follow from that first question you posed to me about, is it war or is it crime? Mm -hmm. If it's war, then you are allowed to have camps where you hold prisoners, and they don't get trials, and they get held until the war is over, the fighting's up. If they're criminals, then you can't have a Guantanamo Bay. If they're criminals, then you have to bring them back to the United States and uh, try them in federal court, and if they're convicted, you hold, you hold them in federal prisons. But we have a very technical definition of war. Congress declares war. You see, this is, so uh, this if, is where they, I, if Congress yeah. has not declared war, we can't exactly treat them as prisoners of war because there is no war for them to be prisoners of. Well, I, I part ways with you there because I think that the country can and has fought uh, wars many times without there being a declaration from Congress. Um, you know, we've only declared war. You mean a war without it being a war? <laughs> without it being declared. Yeah, we have fighting without a, a declared war. Because the commander in chief can send in troops and, and uh, engage well, in warlike activity without it being declared a war. Yeah, so we've had only five declarations of war in our history. Right? We've, and World War II was the last one. Yes. But our troops have been fighting in plenty of what I would call wars, and I bet you would call wars uh, since then. Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan. Um, before that, there were plenty of wars, uh, too, that were not, they just weren't declared by Congress. I think there are a lot of young people that don't know that the Vietnam War was not a war. Well, it wasn't declared war. Yes, so I it think, was like, an undeclared think, war, even though we had a draft. Oh, yeah, Korea, too. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. No, I think that the, the I think that you know when we look at the Constitution, a lot of people see, oh, Congress has a power to declare war. So in our modern sense of things, we go, oh, that must mean Congress gets to start war. But I think in the 18th century, when the framers wrote the Constitution, that's not what a declaration of war means. It didn't mean uh, Congress has the power to decide to start hostilities. I think war declared war was a very serious final step in a whole spectrum of different hostilities between countries. And the second thing about declared war, your point, it goes to this earlier point you made. This fundamental question you've asked is you may not even declare war against terrorist groups because they're not nation. So they may, shouldn't get the benefit of a declaration of war. Yes, I understand. It, it is a confusing... It, it can imagine if this confuses legal scholars what it does to the average citizen or someone like me, and I appreciate you being here today to help us straighten it out. We have to take another short break. Stay right where you are. We'll be right back with more from John Yu. You're listening to the Costa Report. If you listen to the news today, you might come away with the impression that our biggest challenges are political and economic. But if this were true, then countries which have different political and economic systems would be facing different problems. But they aren't. Every government and every nation is struggling with job creation, debt, immigration, climate change, terrorism, health care, energy, and wild swings in financial markets. So something else must be going on. That's why I'm inviting you to get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, a book which shows how the Roman, Mayan, and Khmer empires once faced similar challenges and what we can do to avoid their fate. Visit RebeccaCosta.com today and get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, because once you do, you'll never look at the world the same way. When your home needs repairs, you fix it. Shouldn't we treat our bodies just as well? If you have joint pain, it's time to get help. Learn more at DominicanHospital.org. Dignity Health, including Dominican Hospital. Hello, human kindness. An intimate evening with Dr. Joel Wallach. He will be speaking at two locations March 4th and 5th. Want more than just the Dead Doctors Don't Lie show? 
Do you want to meet the man who took on the FDA in court multiple times and won? Dr. Wallach will speak more in depth on his research and success with the Longevity Company and how he's helping millions of people around the world reverse and prevent chronic illness and become financially healthy. Forget prescription drugs and get personalized info on what nutrients you may be lacking. Join us Wednesday, March 4th at the Elkhorn Yacht Club in Moss Landing or Thursday, March 5th at De Anza Santa Cruz. Registration for both events is at 5.30 p.m. and Doc will start promptly at 6.30. We have time dedicated for questions with the Doc and knowledgeable longevity reps. Reservations are highly recommended and both events are anticipated to reach full capacity. Please RSVP at drjwallet.eventbrite.com or call Health Coach Tara, 831-566-1654. That's 831-566-1654. This is a free event. Hi, folks. Warren Knox here of Knox Roofing. Are you aware of the 10 most wanted? Miss Sally Sunshine. She'll bake your underlayments to a crisp. Mr. Douglas Fur, known to crash into your roof without any consultation or hesitation. Mr. Forest Fire. If you don't have a fire-resistant roof, he'll toast you when he comes through your town. Mr. Joe Blow Roofer. Consider him armed and dangerous. He'll take your money and leave you with a disaster waiting to happen. Mr. Raging Rain will get into your nooks and crannies and soak you. Miss Windy Storm. She'll give your roof a royal lift when you least expect it. Mrs. Frida Frigid, her cold temperatures will crack your old shingles. Mr. Hal Handyman, he'll break more tiles and scuff up more shingles than cleaning your gutters are worth. Mr. Raunchy Roden, he'll chew a hole into your home and he'll make it his own. And last is Mr. Old Man Time. This man will visit every roof sooner or later and when he does, your time will be up. Okay, call Knox Riving to keep the 10 most wanted out of your home. 461-0634. Thanks, folks. Michael Olson's second law of the food chain. The farther we go from the source of our food, the less control we have over what's in our food. Now that so much of our food comes from thousands of miles away, we should all get together Saturday at 9 a.m. as the Food Chain Radio Show tracks down who is putting what in our food. If you have a comment about the second law of the food chain, tell me. Michael Olson, all about it at MetroFarm.com. Now, see you all on KSEO Saturday at 9 a.m. for some What's Eating What Radio on the Food Chain. What day was that? Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, my guest today is John Yu. And before the break, we were talking about wars that were never declared wars by Congress, such as our engagements in uh, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq. Um, Now, Mr. Yu, you've been vocal about... um, the uh, power of the executive branch and the president's authority to order troops into war without seeking congressional support. And you make the point that Congress's power comes from control of the purse to fund war activities. So if they're not in agreement and lockstep with the president, they simply don't fund military operations. Can, can you speak to that for a moment? Yes, and I feel bad for you because clearly you've read what I've written. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, I try. (laughs) I'm proud of you, but I I feel bad for you at the same time. (laughs) I I try, but I I have to say that, uh, you know, I'm not a lawyer, and uh, it's just like talking to a neuroscientist. I always feel feel a bit undressed. Well, we we live in California, so people do that all the time out in public. Yeah, there, there you go. So, so can you talk a little yeah. bit about that relationship where where yeah, so, war is concerned? Yeah, so I think many people have the view I think you were describing earlier, where they think, oh, Congress declares war first, then the president fights it, and that's kind of uh, so. I think a modern reading of the words of the Constitution that actually aren't what the framers intended in their world with the language that meant then. Instead, I think what the Constitution set up was a set of powers with the president, he's primarily commander-in-chief, and a set of powers with Congress. And if they cooperate together, the country can uh, fight war with unity and full purpose and full effectiveness. But that if there's disagreement between the branches, well, then they're going to fight and struggle between each other with these powers. Now, for a long time, until 1945, Congress had a complete check, I think, on the president because of the powers you discussed, the funding power, the power of the size of the military. We didn't have a standing military in this country of any size until after World War II. So if the president in the 
period before that wanted to go to war, he would have to go to Congress and say, please build me an army yes. or, and a navy to fight this war. So there was no way for the president to really fight any significant war unless Congress paid for it. Since 1945, it's different because Congress would, you know, President and Congress have co- cooperated to create the largest military in the world, larger than all other countries' militaries put together. And Congress doesn't place any restrictions on the use of it. And so the president has more of an advantage in that system. But that's only because Congress uh, allows him to have that advantage. Right. At any point, if they don't agree, they can cut off funding. But on the other hand, it's a matter of historical record that that's not a closed-loop system. Uh, The CIA has initiated creative ways of funding private wars without Congress, uh, as in the case of Iran-Contra. And also during Vietnam, they funded operations in Laos and Cambodia with no congressional approval. So, yes, so I, I mean, if they're going to go outside the system and raise the money through allies or through illegal activities, um, it doesn't really work for the Congress to hold strings on the purse, does it? Yes, I, I agree. There have been cases where uh, members of the executive branch have gone too far and tried to get around Congress's power of the purse, usually with disastrous effects for the, the executive branch and for our policies. Um, and, and, and those actions were, I think, would be unconstitutional. I don't think the president can fight wars using money that Congress hasn't appropriated. Almost, as you mentioned, Iran Contra, for example, almost brought down the Reagan administration. You know, one of the most popular and arguably successful administrations of uh, you know of our time, almost destroyed by Ali North and John Poindexter trying to pull this. Uh, sort of war off the books that you describe, which actually to me shows how effective the power of the purse is, even uh, with a Congress that isn't going to challenge the president very often. In fact, I think another dynamic is working here, which uh, people may not like, but I don't think is unconstitutional, which is that Congress likes it this way. You know, Congress votes this huge army, navy, air force, lets the president use it, doesn't restrict him because it doesn't give any responsibility or accountability to Congress for a war. Congressmen congressmen hate voting up or down on wars. They'd rather the president have that responsibility, and if the war goes badly, it's his fault. And if it goes well, well, they voted the supplies and support for the war in the first place. So this is, I mean, this is not a great political uh, outcome because it reduces, uh, you know, our ability to hold people responsible for foreign policy decisions. But Constitutionally, it's certainly acceptable, just as there have been times in our history when Congress has been the dominant uh, power in foreign affairs. Actually, I think in those periods, our national security has been much worse off than when presidents have been the ones really with the initiative. Uh, There have been wars that Congress has pushed us into, like the War of 1812, which were terrible for our country, and presidents didn't have the guts to stop it. Now, we've been talking today about some of the problems with defining torture and enemy combatants and also the powers of the executive branch. So let me ask you um, our, uh, your opinion about this. Are we at war with ISIL? Um, I think we are. I think that we are treating like, – I just don't think we're pursuing it very strongly or aggressively. But I, think, I do think the United States is in a war with – uh, ISIS or ISIL or an Islamic State, uh, you know, whatever name you want to give it, um, they've attacked our citizens. They've attacked our allies. We're using force on them, right? We're we're bombing them in coordination with allies there. I don't buy the Obama administration taking the position which it has with the war in Libya and since that just bombing people, but without inserting ground troops means it's not a war. I I, just, I, I think that's uh, silly, and I think most people think that's not, you know, that that's not a serious interpretation of the Constitution. But that's the position they took, which I think would have surprised, uh, uh, you know, Muammar Gaddafi, for one, who we tried to kill with, you know, with missiles and bombs. I think if we're trying to kill the head of state of another country, even just from the air, we're at war with that country, for sure. So this is going to sound like an incredibly naive question to ask you, but aside from Congress declaring we're at war, how do we know if we are a nation at war? Hey, this is not a naive question. This is a very uh, this is a hard question. I mean, this is the uh, question has become more difficult, as you were pointing out earlier, because of nine eleven. You know, it's harder to tell what war is when our enemies are not the same as they used to be. You know, they're not nations. They can also be groups, but groups that have the power of countries, and they're fighting us in unconventional ways that look more like crime, but are much more destructive. And so I can understand 
as you've said, a lot of people in our country, even today, uh, 14 years after the 9-11 tax, are confused about what we're facing. But I think that's because of the enemy and the way they choose to fight. And so, again, I'd return to this, well, the last thing we'd want to do is because we have this enemy that won't fight fair, that's violating all the civilized rules. I mean, you've got these people in, in the Middle East, ISIS, are beheading Christians and burning captured prisoners alive and doing those incredible barbaric things. Because they act that way doesn't mean, oh, we, we should say, oh, they're not really like Nazi Germany. They're not a nation, so we're not going to consider ourselves at war. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think because they are so terrible, they're like pirates of the old days. They're like mercenary bands who are fighting on behalf of no country. They're the worst of the worst. We actually should pursue them the hardest, not only say we're going to limit ourselves to fighting them with the FBI and the judicial system. Are, are the FBI and the judicial system not, are, are, aren't able to handle something like these kinds of terrorist groups. That's yes. one, unfortunately another thing we learned on 9-11. But one thing we did learn uh, post 9-11 is also when the nation feels it's under threat by terrorist organizations, which are not necessarily part of a government military of a foreign nation, we've learned that the uh, powers of the executive branch become greater. Uh, because uh, there are certain powers allowed by the president uh, when the nation is under threat. And so it is important to some extent to define whether we're at war, whether we are seriously at threat or not, because that uh, opens the door for the president to uh, take certain liberties. Now, unfortunately, we're going to have to, I, I do want to address that, but we're going to have to take our final break. So before I get your answer on that, I think we'll go to break here. And then when we come back, you can answer whether we are in threat and have been under threat since 9-11 and whether these things like warrantless wiretaps and and um, uh, and, 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 and some of the other uh, interrogation techniques, whether those are, are going to persist for long periods of time because we are under threat and we are, in fact, uh, in a war. We have to take our final break. We'll be right back with our guest, John Yu. You're listening to The Costa Report. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars, and I have a question for you, Scott. What goes into making Method Champenois Bubble? You know, it's a process that's really defined by the French government that we've taken and enacted into our wines, which really drive the quality of our sparkling project. So this is a process that the French government defines pretty specifically, and you remain faithful to that. Yeah, 100%, and in some places we push it a little bit. Now, how do the bubbles translate on the palate? You know, it really gives you that vehicle, that mousse for the character of the sparkling wine, carrying the fruit and the complexity. It's the expression of the wine. To find out more about Caraccioli Wines, visit us at www.caracciolicellars.com or stop by our tasting room in downtown Carmel, California. That's Caraccioli Cellars, C-A-R-A-C-C-I-O-L-I, Cellars, come taste the difference. If you're wondering what to do with all that data you're creating, do I have an offer for you? Tableau is drag-and-drop software that people of any skill level can use to analyze and turn data into something actionable. That's right. I said actionable. And isn't that what all that data is for? With Tableau, you can connect to any data in virtually any format and visualize it on the fly. Databases, spreadsheets, even big data sources are instantly combined into usable charts, graphs, reports, and dashboards. People can analyze data and drag and drop at 10 times the speed of a traditional business intelligence system. But the most impressive thing about Tableau is that anyone can use it. And just to prove the point, you can get a free 14-day trial from Tableau just by mentioning you heard this ad. But do it now, because this offer won't last. For your free 14-day trial, visit Tableau at T-A-B-L-E-A-U dot com slash Costa. That's Tableau dot com slash Costa. Tableau Software. What's your data trying to tell you? 
Not available in California, Louisiana, and Virginia. Listeners, do you have startup capital and want to invest in a booming business with incredible profit and growth potential? The opportunity is now because Fresh Healthy Vending, the number one healthy vending franchise in North America, is looking for a few business-savvy, healthy-minded people right here in the local area to become Fresh Healthy Vending franchise owners. We're growing so fast that we've had hundreds of new franchise owners in the last few years alone. Now you can join them. This area has a huge demand for Fresh Healthy Organic Snacks on the go, and that's exactly what you'll be selling with your fresh healthy vending machines we've already identified prime high traffic locations that are perfect for healthy vending machines now we just need the right people to join our franchise network and help fresh healthy vending continue to boom if this sounds like you go to readyforfresh.com today and enter code 6565 we'll send you a free owner information kit as an added bonus to new franchise owners we'll also pay half the franchise fees hurry this offer is limited just go to readyforfresh.com and enter code 6565 that's readyforfresh.com code 6565 the original Stagnero family has been in business since 1879. The Stagnero name stands for quality, quantity, and great service. The family's Gilda's Restaurant on the Santa Cruz Municipal Wharf is still the fishing headquarters of the Santa Cruz area. It's where fishermen gather each morning for coffee and breakfast before heading out on the bay. Stop by Gilda's and say hi. Dino looks forward to meeting you at Gilda's on the center of the Santa Cruz Municipal Wharf. This is Steph. This is Rob. Join us for Out in Santa Cruz Saturdays at 7 p.m. as we bring you the hottest LGBT topics and guests of the week. It's fun, it's fabulous, and we don't shy away from controversy. Visit outinsantacruz.com for past shows and more. And follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Remember, join us on Out in Santa Cruz at 7 p.m. Saturdays on KSCO AM 1080. I'm Steph. I'm Rob. And, and you've, you've been, been queered. queered. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is John Yu. And um, I, I wanted to ask you uh, whether the powers of the executive branch grew after 9-11 and whether those powers are going to continue because the, the threat is continuing. Uh, for example, uh, warrantless wiretaps. Uh, have we opened the door to circumventing warrants? I mean, why, why does anyone need a warrant anymore if they can claim it? It's a matter of national security. I agree with your worry, I and mean, that's one of the uh, reasons I think you're right to say, well, we've got to be very careful and precise about defining when we're at war or not, because when we're at war, we want the government to have broader powers, not just in surveillance, but also just in the use of force. You know, with the, if you're not at war, you can't use drones to shoot suspects you know, abroad with missiles, and you can't listen in on wiretaps uh, without a warrant, as you say. So I, you're quite right that when you switch to war from peacetime, you are expanding the powers of the executive, certainly, but you're also expanding the powers of the government as a whole. Uh, and I, I agree with you. I don't think we want to live in a world where we're constantly at war all the time. But that uh, seems to be the world we're in. We're kind of in a war that hasn't been declared war all the time now uh, that it requires the executive office to have privileges that you should have under war. Yes, I, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if, it, I if don't. what I said made any sense at all. But No, no, no. It, it makes perfect sense. I mean, this is the same worry people had during the Cold War. Uh, and, I, and I think that in the end, our country and our political system and our constitution were robust enough to, uh, as a system to make sure that even though we had to be more vigilant, spend more on the military, again, the first time we ever had a standing army and navy in our history, is during this period, a huge one, too, and take these kinds of measures, you know, classified information and a CIA, which we had never had before, and uh, all those measures. But I also don't think that during this period that the United States was a police state and that civil liberties were severely curtailed. In fact, you could say that the post-1945 period was perhaps the greatest flourishing of individual liberty our country ever knew. We had the civil rights movement, we had gender equality, we had all kinds of amazing developments that expanded individual liberty. So I, I feel confident that, you know, that the United States and our country can continue to maintain that tradition without uh, losing a step in fighting our external enemies. So I think we're seeing that now with these issues you're talking about, with surveillance, for example. We are, I think we, we as a country are allowing the government to conduct broader kinds of electronic surveillance 
than it would do in peacetime, but it's trying to do it in a responsible and necessary way, in, in a way that doesn't, where the government's just not tre- keeping track of everybody in the country for the sake of it, but it's trying to, you know, sift, they're trying to sift through the billions and billions of innocent communications to find the ones that are by the terrorists. We know they use uh, normal looking communications to carry out their plans to attack the United States. And they're, you know, our, our agencies are trying to figure out how to get those messages without infringing on all the innocent and normal communications. And that's something we have to, that's why we have political representatives that we elect to office. We have to trust the president and the Congress together to work together to try to strike that balance. And well, if they what don't, do you, what do you say to people who say this is the beginning of creepage? You know, it just keeps creeping and creeping and creeping. I mean, we're not. Yeah, we call that the yeah. We go in law. We call that the slippery slope argument. Right? Well, of like course. if you if you do this, then you're just the next step to doing that. This is a look. This is an argument that is often made in our country when civil liberties uh, are sometimes infringed on. But I would say in our history, none of those predictions have ever come true, mm-hmm. and I don't think that they'll come true now. I don't think any, I don't see anything in our history as a country to suggest that our political leaders are really interested in trying to, right, run down the road all the way to a kind of police state or national security state. It has never happened, even when we've been under, uh, you know, threats uh, as bad or perhaps worse like this, like the Soviet Union in the Cold War period. So I, I actually think our people in government are trying to be very responsible in balancing the need to get this information with uh, individual liberty and privacy. And I was one of those two people. I don't want to live in a world where people just read my emails, listen to my phone calls for the fun of it, and keep files on all of us to follow us around. But I do think that our government also can't be handicapped from carrying out its mission of protecting us from attack by people trying to infiltrate the country and disguise themselves as civilians and then carry out attacks like 9-11. I, I think so far the country has done it, the government's done it, and I think a majority of Americans have consistently, when this has been put to the test in elections, have been satisfied with the balance. And the courts have too. The courts have not thrown any of this out so far. In fact, they've, uh, in many respects, have accepted and blessed what the other branches are doing. They absolutely have, and you're right about that. And I get lots of uh, emails about this when I say, well, they're welcome to check all my emails and phone calls because they're not very interesting. (laughs) Yeah, it's just got to be a lot of people from Nigeria offering to lend you millions of dollars. That's exactly (laughs) right. So, you know, give me the form. I'll fill it out and say, you know, have uh, have at it. Go ahead. Listen, listen up all you want. Uh, I think you ought to uh, provide the people that have to listen to my messages lots of caffeine uh, and no dose. Um, lastly, I just wanted to ask if you if you had to do it over again, would you include a stern warning with your legal opinion that that there was danger in overstepping? I, I realize that was not your position as as deputy attorney general, uh, but there's that old saying: you give people an inch, they'll take a mile. Um, it almost feels as though, uh, in some instances, that occurred here. I I think that's maybe some people might have that impression, but I think if you look at the facts compared to what the United States has done in past wars, I think people here were trying to be uh, restrained and responsible. You know, first to answer your question, your exact question, you know, as a lawyer, I you know I think it's our job to give the people have to make the harder decisions. What the best reading of what the law allows and doesn't allow. Yes, and you're right. And that's a say, technical issue. That's a yeah. technical issue. And then we can say, yeah. yeah, and we can say, look, be careful. Here are, you know, political costs and minuses or policy costs and minuses, but that should not influence how we interpret the law. You know, that's that's why we uh, elect people like George Bush or Barack Obama to office. They get paid the big bucks to make the really hard decision, which is, even if I can do this legally. Is it a good idea? Is it a good policy? Right? Should I yes. use drones to shoot people who are terrorists, even Americans? That's The law may allow you to do that, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea. And that's the harder question. I think sometimes in our country, people want the law to answer all the questions for them. And that's not what we do. The law, you know, it's like it, it sets out the playing field, right? It tells you what's inbounds and out of bounds, but you still have to call the plays. And I think that's, you know, the law doesn't answer all the questions. They're the hardest questions like, the ones you're posing are the ones that our political leaders that we elect have to decide. Well, that's where the law and policy differ. 
And yeah. uh, sometimes we do. You're right about this. We do get confused. We want the law to set policy, but someone has to eventually make that decision. Now, we are almost out of time, but before we let you go, do you have a website where listeners can go to get information on your books and keep up with your activities? God, I wish I did. <laughs> I, mean, I, I need to get a 12-year-old kid who could probably put all together in you about 30 do. minutes. You do. You're right here near Silicon Valley, and you don't have, you don't have a website. Now, where... no, I have you know, a website at Berkeley at the law school and one at okay. the American Enterprise Institute, and the, the, those both collect uh, a lot of things I write and uh, do, so, but uh, okay, I wish so I did. Okay, so they, can, they can go to the uh, University of California Berkeley website, and uh, if you type in John Yu, you'll go to his website, and you'll be able to get information on his books. Unfortunately, we are out of time for today, but before we say goodbye, I want to thank you for uh, helping us set the record straight and for taking time to be with us today. Thank you, Mr. Yu. Oh, thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Anytime. If your station is leaving us after the first hour and you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with John Yu, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. And if you joined our broadcast late or you missed the interview with you, remember you can always download episodes of the Costa Report from our website, Apple iTunes, Podbean, and our new YouTube channel. And be sure to check out our new radio blog, which is posted every week on our website. Uh, the blog captures the headline from our interviews every week so take a moment to check it out and uh, while you're there at the website be sure you register so you automatically receive our monthly newsletter uh, which tells you what the upcoming guest list is for the month and uh, it also gives you some new videos and news stories that only the costa report is covering my guest next week is former congressman from Ohio, Mr. Dennis Kucinich, who claims Americans must take back the monetary system and also our right to privacy. How does he propose we do this? Find out when Dennis Kucinich joins us next week on the only news program that puts her policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for a second hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. Big data is changing the way organizations work. From data-driven marketing and ad targeting to the connected car, big data is fueling product innovation and new revenue opportunities. It's creating a culture in which business and IT leaders join forces to realize value from all data. They infuse analytics everywhere and make speed a differentiator, gaining competitive advantage from faster, more informed decisions. Leading organizations are creating new business models, developing new roles, and defining new big data architectures, including an infrastructure that can manage and process exploding volumes of structured and unstructured data, in motion as well as at rest, while protecting data privacy and security. Find out how IBM Big Data and Analytics can transform your business. Visit www.ibm.com slash big data today. As a business owner, hiring the right person can make the difference between success and failure. Hi, my name is William Templeton and I'm the owner of Templeton Quest Investigations. When hiring a new employee for your small business, making the right choice is crucial. Templeton Quest is a local firm offering pre-employment background screening. Have confidence in knowing you've made the right decision. Templeton Quest will provide you with the facts you need to hire right the first time. See how affordable pre-screening is. Contact us for more information at 831-454-8853 or visit us at templetonquest.com. Templeton Quest is a full-service private investigation firm licensed by the state of California. We also offer a range of other general investigative services. California License 27096. Contact us at 831-454-8853 or templetonquest.com. 
serving Northern California for over 65 years. This is KSCO Santa Cruz. This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. Welcome back to the second hour of the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and during the first hour, we spoke with former Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Bush administration, John Yu. As you know, Yu is responsible for uh, several controversial legal opinions, which are uh, the source of debate even today uh, from the right of the president to authorize warrantless wiretapping uh, to the documents which have come to be known as the torture memos, wherein you suggested that uh, certain interrogation techniques such as waterboarding, uh, sleep deprivation, um, and so on are, are legal when it involves matters of national security. As you heard during the first hour, you uh, also was of the opinion that the Constitution does not apply to uh, detainees um, or actions of military personnel on uh, foreign soil, which uh, basically means that what happens in Guantanamo stays in Guantanamo. Or, or so it would have seemed, uh, were it not for the Senate Intelligence Committee's report on CIA torture, which studied the agency's detention and interrogation program. Uh, now, for folks who may not be entirely familiar with this report, it's over 6,000 pages long. You don't want to read it. Um, trust me on this. Read the summary. Uh, and it investigates not only um, several near-death instances, which uh, allegedly occurred during waterboarding, uh, but much more severe tactics, which led to having to remove a detainee's eye, which was so badly damaged, uh, as well as uh, perforated rectums and other very disturbing physical evidence of uh, rectal hydration, feeding, uh, and uh, torture. Uh, as you heard um, Mr. Yu say, the, the there is a great weakness in this report, uh, and I don't think anyone would debate this. Uh, and the weakness in the report is that none of the alleged offenders or victims were interviewed. So there's no corroboration relative to this report. Um, but the report uh, on the positive side, uh, in terms of its veracity, did cost over $40 million. And it did involve scrutinizing 6 million pages of evidence, which unfortunately most of it was provided by the CIA itself. Uh, more than 9,000 classified documents were reviewed. Uh, many of these documents were secretly removed moved from the CIA by the investigating committee uh, without the CIA's knowledge or authorization uh, because they felt that they couldn't rely on the evidence which the CIA was giving them to investigate the CIA. You're asking the CIA to give me evidence to investigate you. So Diane Feinstein and others um, did this because uh, the CIA had uh, ordered and destroyed important evidence uh, such as uh, actual videotaped interrogations. And uh, and destroyed a lot of documents. Uh, and th there is our emails to confirm all of that. Um, so for a while, the Senate committee was um, getting access to and stealing CIA documents before they could be destroyed. And the CIA, uh, in turn, was actually hacking into uh, the investigating senators' computers to see how they were getting uh, the evidence and uh, what the evidence was and what the report was going to say. And, and I'll tell you, the whole thing started to look and sound a lot like a John le Carre novel. Uh, Feinstein was taking portions of the co committee's report and hiding it in a safe in the Hart office building <laughs> to keep the CIA from getting or destroying it. And, um, and a lot of members of our own government were under CIA surveillance. So, uh, uh, yeah, like I said, it, it really started to read like some fictional uh, novel. Now, now, I point all of this out for one reason, and that's so that we have some idea just how difficult it was to get to the bottom of whether torture was being sanctioned as an interrogation tactic by the CIA and whether the information which had been extracted during the use of these techniques really led to anything valuable. In other words, uh, did the ends justify the means? 
And, and I know a lot of listeners today know where I'm going with this. Uh, does the ends ever justify the means? Uh, I mean, aren't aren't we in trouble if every single time we are going to be you doing something questionable, we find ourselves using this argument? I, I mean, it, it, it almost seems like a clue to me. The minute you're trying to justify what you've done, you're already kind of in a weak position. Um, you're already on a slippery slope you don't want to be on. And I, I believe this is where used legal opinions may have been, uh, a, I don't want to say incorrect. They weren't incorrect. They were naive because they opened the door, uh, a door the size of a barn for the CIA, Oval Office, military uh, agents to use the ends justifies the means argument. Uh, from a technical standpoint, use legal opinions were right. That, that's not for me to say, uh, uh, it, it's probably not for me to say as I'm not a legal scholar, so I'm not really qualified to weigh in, but based on everything I could read from the technical point of the law, it seemed like he, he was right on. But what I can say is, is that the threat of terrorism, the danger to national security is an argument that can be legally used to skirt around just about every checks and balances and law designed to protect our liberty and uh, and also to protect the liberty of those we suspect of criminal action um, but have not been charged or convicted. So while experts argue about whether the information extracted from physical torture helped locate bin Laden or thwart other attacks. Frankly, I don't think this debate is worth having because whether it did or it didn't isn't really the issue. The issue is whether any information we would gain can ever, under any circumstances, justify torture. And on this point, I feel the country is squarely divided into those that will say yes and those that will firmly answer no. On that note, We're going to take a short break. When we come back, Bill Graff and Sam Quentin will be joining me for our weekly roundtable. You're listening to the Costa Report. Hi, Registered Pharmacist Ben Fuchs here. I've been studying healthy bodies for 35 years, and what I've got to tell you may shock and surprise you, but if you listen up, it may change your life. What we call grains are really, in essence, the seeds of grass. They're grass seeds. As animals evolved to eat grass, grass evolved to defend themselves. One of the techniques that grass have developed to survive is to have lots of seeds. And this is what makes grasses farmer and agriculture friendly. Seeds contain lots of nutrients that humans can use. And if there's lots of seeds, they're easy to grow. Today, grass seeds and grains, what we call grains, which are really grass seeds, provide the the bulk of nutritional calories for the human being species in the world. In addition to having lots of seeds as a defense mechanism, grasses have developed a second defense mechanism to assure their survival in a world where they're constantly being munched upon and grazed upon by animals. This second mechanism for their survival is chemical warfare. Grasses produce chemicals that are designed to make any animals that would dare to eat them think twice about eating them again. Grass seeds produce opium-like compounds, for example, that numb predators, stun them, and, and make the animals more slow and more sluggish, including humans. This is one of the reasons why grains are considered comfort foods, because they have a kind of relaxing, soporific effect. They put us to sleep. They relax us. They make us feel more comfortable. Grass seeds produce blood clotting chemicals called agglutinins that can kill animals. Hi, this is Rebecca Costa, host of the Costa Report. If you'd like to get in touch with pharmacist Ben Fuchs, let me tell you the quickest, easiest way to communicate with the only pharmacist I know that isn't in a hurry to dispense pharmaceuticals. Sounds funny, doesn't it? A pharmacist who believes pharmaceuticals should be used as the last resort, not the first. You can reach pharmacist Ben right now at RadioBenHealth.com. That's RadioBenHealth.com. And if you'd like to know more about unique nutritional supplements like Beyond Tangy Tangerine or the Healthy Start Pack program, it's the same web address, RadioBenHealth.com. Find out why pharmacist Ben and millions like him are enjoying 
enjoying a healthy, energetic lifestyle by adding mineral supplements to their daily routine. Visit RadioBenHealth.com, RadioBenHealth.com, and get started today. Have you checked out the Costa Report blog yet? Well, what are you waiting for? There's no quicker way to find out what newsmakers are saying than the Costa Report blog at RebeccaCosta.com. It's where the former CEO of Apple and PepsiCo, John Scully, predicts where the next tech breakthroughs are going to come from. And also where Trent Lott explains why a GOP reversal of the Senate nuclear option will signal real change in our nation's capital. And the Costa Report blog is where you'll discover why Alan Dershowitz is worried that ISIS is adopting Hamas-like tactics. You'll find all this and more at the Costa Report blog. A new blog is posted every week, and they're short, pithy, and tell the unvarnished truth. Just go to RebeccaCosta.com to get the latest blog. That's RebeccaCosta.com. And while you're there, be sure to register for updates and breaking news. The Costa Report blog, bringing you the news the big networks don't and won't. If you're wondering what to do with all that data you're creating, do I have an offer for you? Tableau is drag-and-drop software that people of any skill level can use to analyze and turn data into something actionable. That's right. I said actionable. And isn't that what all that data is for? With Tableau, you can connect to any data in virtually any format and visualize it on the fly. Databases, spreadsheets, even big data sources are instantly combined into usable charts, graphs, reports, and dashboards. People can analyze data and drag and drop at 10 times the speed of a traditional business intelligence system. But the most impressive thing about Tableau is that anyone can use it. And just to prove the point, you can get a free 14-day trial from Tableau just by mentioning you heard this ad. But do it now, because this offer won't last. For your free 14-day trial, visit Tableau at T-A-B-L-E-A-U dot com slash Costa. That's Tableau dot com slash Costa. Tableau Software. What's your data trying to tell you? When your home needs repairs, you fix it. Shouldn't we treat our bodies just as well? If you have joint pain, it's time to get help. Learn more at DominicanHospital.org. Dignity Health, including Dominican Hospital. Hello, human kindness. I was in L.A. I was in an apartment and this this big thug was trying to push, big drunken thug was trying to push his way in the door. I was trying to hold the door, but he was overpowering me. And it so happened that those people had a a gun in their apartment and I knew where it was. And it happened to be just not just a few steps away from the door, you know. And and so I, I let go and quickly went and picked up the gun. I didn't have to point it at anyone. I didn't have to cock it. I don't know if I would have known how. The second that guy saw the gun, I didn't even have to raise it up. The second he saw that gun, he was gone. So I told this woman about that. She said, you were lucky. I said, no, I was armed. (laughs) I wasn't lucky. I was armed. Who knows what that guy had in his back pocket? What he might have come in and done. Don't be so namby-pamby, wishy-washy. Being spiritual and being a person of God doesn't mean you're a coward. Doesn't mean you're not able to do violence if it's necessary. Don't be a fool. Don't let them take your country and your freedom away because you're so busy with peace. Remember America every Sunday, 10 till noon on KSCO 1080. KSCO, the sound of freedom. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and Bill Graff and Sam Quentin are joining me in the studio now. So, gentlemen, uh, who wants to get us started? Well, I guess I'll get it started. Uh, say my piece, and then you can all have your way with me after that. Um, did you I, say we I, could have our way with you? He did. Well, you're going to did, uh, did vehemently <laughs> disagree with me. Oh, no. All right, let's, here it let's comes. Let's just put it that here way, it comes. okay? Uh, I very clearly feel that when your enemy sets the bar at beheadings 
and burning people alive to death. Um, there's nothing wrong with a little waterboarding to extract some information from them at uh, Guantanamo Bay. That's just how I feel about it. You have to do what's necessary to win. And I completely disagree with that point of view. You do. I right. think that uh, the bar was set with Hitler when he burned people in ovens and gassed them to death, sending them to what they thought was a shower. And uh, uh, I think that when you uh, when you use that as the bar, that anything we do that remotely resembles that m- lowers us to that level. So torture is torture. Waterboarding is torture by definition. Electric shocks, uh, all that kind of stuff to extract information. Uh, there's a reason why we have something called the Geneva Convention. And I'm sorry, I I just don't think that uh, because because somebody cuts. In but, let me finish. I didn't interrupt you. Just because we line a bunch of people up on a beach and cut all their heads off at once doesn't mean that we can now retaliate with like acts of violence. What do you and think? And I don't I don't see anything even remotely close between waterboarding and beheading. But not even close. But waterboarding is torture. When you simulate drowning to someone, have you ever drowned? Have you ever gotten close to drowning? I have. Well, I'm still alive, so I'm guessing no. Okay. But what I'm saying to you is that 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 torture in any form is wrong. It's just wrong. And by the way, they've proven... You don't want to argue varieties of torture. No, I don't. You're no, saying no. Torture, it's all wrong. Torture is torture, period. If it falls under the definite... Look, look, mm-hmm. there's a reason why we can't torture American citizens. Look, if, if torture was okay, we would take all the gangbangers in Salinas and torture them until they told us where all their friends were so we could go round them up and ship them out of here. But we don't do that because it's not acceptable in the United States of America for American citizens to be tortured by the police. How then is it acceptable to be tortured at Guantanamo Bay? So you don't want a double standard? No, for double, no, how there we is treat... no double. No, there is no double standard. Well, now you can't to do what that. to 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 what you was saying is we have a problem with classification. If we were to treat terrorists as if they were criminals. Right. And bring them into the United they States. They could not be tortured. They could not be tortured. We have a problem when we uh, we have a problem in not knowing how to treat detainees because they are not enemy combatants. They, they, they are, are not, enemy combatants. Well, wait a second. They're not prisoners of war. Let me first of all say they're not prisoners of war because there is no war. They have perpetrated bad things on the United States of America that makes but, them that makes them military combatants in my brain but but our definition of an enemy combatant I think I read then that to you the earlier definition. is that you are government sponsored part of a military campaign you don't think against people the United fighting States. with Al Qaeda are fighting as an entity against us whether it's a bona fide government or not the, the uh, acts of war are between governments they're not between a, a government and an organization this is the this is a semantic well, argument. This is, this is the new wave of war. Welcome to it. Right. We do, we're not fighting another nation. War. This is so the problem So in order to deal have. with these guys properly, should we not change the definition of an en- enemy combatant Absolutely. so we can deal and with Alan, them? Absolutely. And Alan, by the way, Alan Dershowitz is a huge proponent of that. He said, we've got to go to the heart of things because otherwise, if you, first of all, when you, when you uh, act as though you're in a war, like we are with uh, ISIL, whether you put troops on the ground or not, when you act like you're in a war, that gives certain presidential powers, right, that don't exist when you declare there's a war. So what, what's happening is we're acting like we're a war, but Congress isn't declaring we're a war. If Congress would declare we're at war, then these would be prisoners of war, and that we would know how to treat them. Our problem is we don't know how to treat terrorists because we don't know if we're at war or not. We don't have a definition for what to do with them. Uh, my, my they're point, either prisoners of war or they're they're criminals. My point of view What's doesn't. What's the in between? We don't have a definition of what they are or yeah, who and they my, are, and so therefore we don't know but, what to do with them. And they sit there over Guantanamo the for is, ten years. Whatever the definition is, whether it's war or not, that's all semantical argument to me. The 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 rules of engagement don't change. We don't torture people. 
Well, here's the thing, Bill. And, and, and you know who's a great... Who, who, who What's shares, allowing... Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Let, me, let me say all right, this. All right. You know who shares my point of view? Mm-hmm. John McCain, one of the few members of Congress who has actually been, been tortured. tortured. Yes, I understand that. So now can I interrupt you for just a second? I'm done. When, I make when, a good point. When, you do make a good point. And I'm not saying I'm for torture. I'm saying what allows torture is the... The uh, unclear status of who it is that we're, we're uh, detaining. Once their status is established, torture is not allowed. See, I don't think torture should be allowed ever. Well, I understand that. But, but when you're statusless, it opens the door to being treated in ways where you'd, you'd have protection otherwise, is what I'm saying. I'm saying that they don't have protection, and the reason they don't have protection, according to you, is because they're not fighting uh, according to the rules of civilized warfare. If they were, and they were wearing military uniforms, and they were government-sponsored, we'd know how, what status to give them and what protections to give them. See, we don't know what protections to give the people in Guantanamo. And my stance would be entirely different if that were the case. That's correct. But as you, is, he's agreeing with you, Sam. You yeah. is basically saying, if they're not going to fight according to the rules of civilized warfare, they don't get the protections but of see, civilized but warfare. See, Isn't point- that what you're saying, Sam? Well, yeah, pretty they much. They don't deserve the protection. Pretty but much. see, my point of view you is... You don't get the protection of Geneva Convention... If you're not fighting um, if, if, if you're not, according if to if the laws of the Geneva obeying Convention. It. That, see, I, see, I think they should be prosecuted under the same rules of the Co- Geneva Convention, and they should be protected under the same rules as the Geneva Convention, even... Uh, Regardless whether, of how they're if fighting. They're shooting at, if they're shooting at American citizens, or shooting at friends of American citizens... <laughs> Then they're enemy combatants. I don't care what the what the semantical thing is. They're bad guys. Right. But what my point is, is once you classify them, once you declare this an actual war and you declare them as prisoners of war, we know what protections are offered prisoners of war under the Geneva sure. Convention. If they're not prisoners of war, they are not protected by the Geneva Convention. Okay. okay. What, there were a couple of those guys held at Guantanamo who were American citizens. What happened to their rights? Uh, well, come on. I, 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 I mean, I, I mean, you good can, question. Yeah, there you go. There's, and see, there's it a just, good question. They brought uh, civil lawsuits. Uh, against yeah, and the they were, and, but they stood in. The, they're still in those cells, just like the other guys were. For un, un they were un uh, prosecuted, uncharged, uh, un everything. I, I I understand that, and that is a stain in our, in our history. Uh, that's for sure. Now we have to pause to hear from our sponsors, but stay right where you are. Luis Alvarez, the CEO of Alvarez Technology Group, is up next. You're listening listening to the Costa Report. Biodiversity is the very fabric of our lives. It is everything around us, all of nature, but human impact is diminishing biodiversity at an alarming rate. And because of that, the intricate web of biodiversity is unraveling in ways we don't fully understand, and our world is becoming less resilient. That's why we are biodiversity advocates. We're the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation. Guided by the greatest living naturalist, E.O. Wilson, we champion research and education that expands our understanding of biodiversity and informs worldwide conservation efforts. The E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation is building a movement of environmental stewards like you who share our sense of responsibility for the living world that is our home. Join us in our quest to protect biodiversity, the fabric of our lives. Visit eowilsonfoundation.org. As a business owner, hiring the right person can make the difference between success and failure. Hi, my name is William Templeton and I'm the owner of Templeton Quest Investigations. When hiring a new employee for your small business, making the right choice is crucial. Templeton Quest is a local firm offering pre-employment background screening. Have confidence in knowing you've made the right decision. Templeton Quest will provide you with the facts you need to hire right the first time. See how affordable pre-screening is. Contact us for more information at 831-454-8853 or visit us at templetonquest.com. 
Templeton Quest is a full-service private investigation firm licensed by the state of California. We also offer a range of other general investigative services. California License 27096. Contact us at 831-454-8853 or templetonquest.com. Hi, Registered Pharmacist Ben Fuchs here. I've been studying healthy bodies for 35 years, and what I've got to tell you may shock and surprise you, but if you listen up, it may change your life. The body is an electrical system. Every thought we think, eye we blink, move we make, and step we take requires a controlled and powerful burst of electricity. And where does that electrical energy come from? Ultimately, it comes from living or recently living foods, fruits, vegetables, fresh dairy, eggs, meats, and seafood. Unfortunately, most of the foods we subsist on are far from farm fresh. That's because in the food business, there's an antagonistic relationship between energy and economics. High-energy fresh foods are prone to instability, which can be observed as product degradation and breakdown. And this represents a problem. In the food business, there are few considerations more important than shelf life. That's where food processing, which is essentially a technology that eliminates high-energy food molecules, comes in. Food that won't rot or go rancid, and that can be shipped and shelved and sold for profit. On the other hand, because the eliminated unstable compounds represent energy, foods that have been manipulated and mangled in this fashion while being stable for long periods have lost their electrical value. Ninety percent of American calories come from processed foods. The body's an electrical system. Its life force is electrical, and this electrical life energy is ultimately derived from the foods we eat. Processed food, however, has been robbed of this life force, and while processors are under government mandate to add in some synthetic biomimicking micronutrients, that's called enrichment, if you're looking for a reason for the abysmal state of the health of the American public, you couldn't pick one that's more significant than the fact that most of the food we're eating is electrically empty and essentially dead. Pharmacist Ben here urging you to go to kscohealth.com to order Beyond Tangy Tangerine, the Healthy Start Pack, and other nutritional supplements that I personally use and recommend. You can purchase these premium quality products at wholesale prices online at kscohealth.com. KSCOHealth.com. That's KSCOHealth.com. I'm the pharmacist that believes that staying healthy and strong is not only about medicine, it's about giving your body the raw materials it needs to do its work. Go to KSCOHealth.com. Make sure you check out the cool videos, too, at KSCOHealth.com. That's KSCOHealth.com. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and Luis Alvarez, the CEO of Alvarez Technology Group, is back with us again. Thank you for joining the program, Luis. I'm happy to be here, Rebecca. How are you? I'm good. Boy, your phone sounds a little bit fuzzy today. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I, uh, there you go. Out. Yeah. A little, little technology. bit better. Darn it. Why doesn't it work when it needs to? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. And you're our technology guy. So, <laughs> so hey, what, what did you think about our conversation with John Yu today? You know, it was really interesting. Um, Mr. Yu is largely known for his role in justifying the use of, you know, so-called enhanced interrogation techniques under the Bush administration, which some people consider to be torture. But I mostly remember him as the person who opened Pandora's box when it came to the NSA spying on, on American citizens. As you know, that's still a you know, very heated topic of debate today, more than a decade later. Uh, and, you know, before I get to that point, I have to confess that while I was in the Air Force, I trained as an interrogator and had the opportunity to use those skills a few times when I was in the Air Force Reserve. So as someone who has direct knowledge of the way our military interrogates prisoners during times of war, I can tell you that any sort of enhanced techniques are more often than not you know, counterproductive. I think the 6,000-page Senate report pretty much confirmed that uh, little or no intelligence came out of the use of these enhanced interrogation techniques. Yeah, you know, common sense tells you that if you cause someone pain and, and discomfort or, or threaten them or, or their families, they'll tell you pretty much anything that you want to hear in order to stop you. And I'm proud of the fact that most of us who trained as interrogators know that there are more reliable and effective ways to get information. Uh, well, anyway, that's, that's enough about that. Let me get off my soapbox and start talking about what I'm supposed to be talking about, which is technology. <laughs> well, actually, I, I didn't know you'd train as a military interrogator, so thanks for bringing that up. I, I, I learn something about you every time. Well, that, thanks for, for a few seconds to let me <laughs> so, so Anyway, get, getting back to the NSA rulings, what... What many people don't know is that until the Bush administration changed the rules, the NSA was strictly for, prohibited from doing any sort of surveillance that might track an American citizen, and, and not only on U.S. soil, but overseas as well. The, the NSA was very careful to restrict its, its activities, 
uh, so as to not inadvertently listen in on, on any U.S. citizen. You know, I do remember a time when you needed a warrant to have access to pretty much anything for a U.S. citizen. Yeah, the good old days. I remember those well. Well, you know, you you and I both know that all that changed after 9-11. Mm-hmm. The Bush administration saw the, the war on terror and al-Qaeda as a threat to the country, which justified the use of the NSA's surveillance capabilities on American soil and American citizens. And despite all the revelations that began with Eric Snowden's you know, massive data dump of classified intelligence information, the NSA genie has yet to be put back into the bottle which was really front and center recently when the president, President Obama, convened a summit in Silicon Valley to address the issues of cybersecurity. He invited the leaders of a lot of the top tech companies to attend, but many of them, including the heads of Google and Yahoo, declined to participate, which some people saw as a sign of protest against the government's continued surveillance of Americans. You know, it was really surprising that these very public companies, the heads of these public companies, just refused to meet with the president. That that was a real signal. Uh, it, it, you know, it is. And, and the truth is, by cooperating and, and turning over data in the past, many of these U.S. companies have been significantly hurt. Trust in American technology businesses has decreased since these, you know, the documents that Snowden released suggested that the NSA was directly tapping into the servers of nine U.S. companies to obtain customer data for national security investigations under a program called PRISM. And, you know, given the heightened concern overseas about the um, NSA's ability to access data stored by U.S. companies, those companies that, that offer cloud computing and web hosting services are experiencing a, an acute economic fallout. And some of the, the declines in business are over you know, 50 percent. And just last week, we learned from a security company called Kaspersky Lab that the NSA is suspected of being behind the most ambitious cyber hacking effort ever uncovered, going back almost 14 years. And the level of sophistication and the depth of penetration of U.S. hardware and software vendors with this malicious code designed to spy on users, you know, leaves little doubt that the government was behind the effort. So the government is behind a cyber hacking effort in order to gain information on uh, American citizens? That's what Kaspersky Lab revealed. They, their analysis showed that for over 14 years, secret code had been embedded into all sorts of technology, which um, would allow somebody to, to track the data and, and uh, send information back to um, uh, what you know, hidden websites on the web and And given how sophisticated the the code was, their conclusion is that it could only have happened if you had uh, somebody like the NSA behind that effort. So did the private companies not know this code existed? Uh, Yes, they were as blindsided as the public was, uh, at least theoretically. No one's come out and admitted that they knew what was going on. But uh, the reality is that, you you know, if, if you know how to do this sort of stuff, you can even hide it, hide it from company. Wow. You know, I, I have real issues with uh, using national security, uh, the threat to national security as a way to circumvent the need for warrants. So, you know, this just scares me when I hear that the government was embedding code in private, you know, uh, companies in order to be able to hack their databases and information for almost 14 years. I mean, it's shocking. It is. And, and even to this day, there are government agencies in the U.S. and Europe that insist that tech companies have to balance privacy concerns with national security interests by providing some sort of backdoor access to all of their systems. And, and let's face it, tech companies don't want to be put in that position. They don't want to balance privacy against national security. But you know, like I said earlier, that, that genie that John Yu and the Bush administration unleashed is not going to go into the battle back into the bottle anytime soon, not without a fight anyway. I I agree with you. I don't know how you put it back in the bottle. Again, you know, once uh, once you start to use the threat of national security as an excuse to, uh, and maybe excuse isn't the right word, you know, as a reason for circumventing, yeah, yeah circumventing yeah. the need for warrants to obtain this information, it's not just a slippery slope, it's a ski slope. Well, and a lot has to do with the fact that the decision makers in the government um, largely are ignorant of the technology and, and, and what it means. So there's a certain amount of fear, I suspect, 
in the decisions that they're making and the, the fear is really that the bad guys are going to use that technology to, to you know, circumvent the traditional means of gathering information. But I think they're, they're, they're really, uh, you know, overblowing that likelihood. And uh, tech companies are happy to, um, to help as much as they need to, but they want to do it legally and they want to do it under a system that says that, you know, the privacy of the people using these systems wasn't violated or, you know, there wasn't some sort of wholesale um, mining of data without the knowledge of, of the people involved. Well, the problem, of course, is, of course, logic dictates the more information you have on private citizens and individuals, the better you can protect them. Of course, that's logical. But at what price? Yeah, and that's the question. And I think we're all going to be asking that question more and more as as we learn about these government agencies you know, around the world, not just in the U.S. and Europe, but, you know, at, at least here we have a press that can uh, can dig up facts and figures and report back on them. I feel sorry for those countries in, in Asia, China in particular, where uh, those citizens are under watch all the time and they know it and they have no option in it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's all the time we have today. But thank you, Lewis, for uh, expanding on the impact that you's legal opinions have had on uh, warrantless wiretapping and how that's affected uh, collecting information over the Internet and individual privacy and uh, giving us a peek of what may lie ahead, which isn't looking too good. But certainly appreciate you being here today. Well, it was a pleasure, Rebecca. This is Lewis Alvarez from the Alvarez Technology Group reminding you that when it comes to technology, we're warned it's on. We're going to take another short break. When we return, Mitchell Winnick, the dean of the Monterey College of Law, will be joining us. You're listening to the Costa Report. Every day our world gets more complicated. Not only is new information coming at us faster than we can manage, new regulations, technology, and the effects of globalization have made it much more difficult to succeed. That's why I wrote The Watchman's Rattle, a book that, for the first time, explains how complexity makes it hard to separate facts from fiction and eventually causes us to make important decisions based on unproven beliefs. And not just us, our leaders also fall prey to this phenomena. But here's the good news. Once you know the symptoms to watch for, you can safeguard against them. So please, go to RebeccaCosta.com, that's RebeccaCosta.com, and order your copy of The Watchman's Rattle. It only takes a few minutes and the shipping is free. That's RebeccaCosta.com. Do it now, you'll be glad you did. No matter what business you're in, what happens in Washington can make the difference between business success or failure. That's why understanding where government is headed is so important in today's competitive business environment. But where can you find experts who know firsthand the inner workings of our nation's capital? The American Program Bureau is your leading source for speakers whose experience offer unique insights into where U.S. policy is headed. Speakers like Seth Harris, former acting U.S. Secretary of Labor, Alyssa Mastromonaco, former White House Deputy Chief of Staff, and General Carl Eikenberry, former U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan. For your next meeting or conference, contact the American Program Bureau at apbspeakers.com or 617-614-1600. That's apbspeakers.com. The American Program Bureau, making history one speech at a time. Hi folks, Warren Knox here of Knox Roofing. Are you aware of the 10 most wanted? Miss Sally Sunshine, she'll bake your underlayments to a crisp. Mr. Douglas Fir, known to crash into your roof without any consultation or hesitation. Mr. Forest Fire, if you don't have a fire-resistant roof, he'll toast you when he comes through your town. Mr. Joe Blow Roofer, consider him armed and dangerous. He'll take your money and leave you with a disaster waiting to happen. Mr. Raging Rain will get into your nooks and crannies and soak you. Miss Windy Storm, she'll give your roof 
proof a royal lift when you least expect it. Mrs. Frida Frigid, her cold temperatures will crack your old shingles. Mr. Hal Handyman, he'll break more tiles and scuff up more shingles than cleaning your gutters are worth. Mr. Raunchy Roden, he'll chew a hole into your home and he'll make it his own. And last is Mr. Old Man Time. This man will visit every roof sooner or later, and when he does, your time will be up. Okay, call Knox Roofing to keep the 10 most wanted out of your home. 461-0634. Thanks, folks. Do you have a plan for your money? Does your money come and go like the tides? Do you just leave your finances to fate? Cash is always flowing, money is always moving, and if you don't manage it, it will move away from you. So many people actually spend more time planning their next trip to the dentist than they do something even more important like their retirement. You know what they say, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Don't leave your financial future to fate. Take charge. Listen to Money Moves every Thursday at 7 p.m. here on KSCO AM 1080. Money Moves is dedicated to providing you tips and tools so you can manage your own money effectively. No one cares about your money more than you do. Therefore, you need the skills to manage your money. Listen to Money Moves every Thursday at 7 p.m. here on KSCO AM 1080. Back to the Costa Report. Mitchell Winnick, the Dean of the Monterey College of Law, is joining us. Welcome to the program, Mitch. Thank you, Rebecca. It's a pleasure to be on today. Well, Mitch, during the first hour, we spoke with John Yu, a former Deputy Assistant Attorney General with the Office of Legal Counsel, who, as you know, is uh, best known as the author of uh, many controversial memos, uh, some that have been called the torture memos, but... Uh, before we get into the details of those memos, I thought maybe you could explain what the Office of Legal Counsel is and what they do. Uh, that's a good idea, Rebecca. Uh, the Office of Legal Counsel provides authoritative legal advice to the president and all of the executive branch agencies. It drafts the legal opinions of the U.S. Attorney General, and it also is responsible for providing legal advice to the president and the executive branch on all constitutional questions related to existing laws and even pending legislation. Well, that puts a number of things into context. So when Mr. Yu was serving as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel, his job was to provide legal opinions that could be relied on by the Attorney General, the Secretary of State, the CIA, the FBI, and the President of the United States. You know, that's absolutely correct. And, and in fact, for a period of time, he served as the acting director of the Office of Legal Counsel. It was actually during this period that he wrote the memo to the Department of Defense in which he concluded that federal laws against torture, assault, and maiming would not apply to the overseas interrogation of terror suspects. Now, that just seems to fly in the face of U.S. policies and our position with the international community to fight against terrorism and torture. Well, you know, I certainly agree with that. And, and that's why Mr. Yu's controversial and, and I must say subsequently discredited legal opinions regarding the definition and use of torture became the centerpiece of controversy surrounding the CIA's treatment of prisoners in U.S. custody in both Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay. You know, in fact, the leaders of the Senate Intelligence and Armed Services Committees concluded that the Department of Defense used Mr. Yu's memo to actually justify the harsh interrogation practices on terror suspects at Guantanamo Bay and the Abu Ghraib torture and prisoner abuse. Mitch, I, I know that it's common to joke about the term legal ethics being an oxymoron, uh, but I know there were some allegations that Mr. Yu violated the rules of attorney professional conduct, uh, claiming that he manipulated his legal opinion to justify torture. Can, can you help us understand what professional standards would be applied to a government attorney like Mr. Yu uh, as opposed to a civilian attorney? Uh, because I, I thought they had immunity for these kinds of accusations. Well, in fact, they do have a limited immunity as to 
possible criminal prosecution. But in this case, the Department of Justice's Office of Professional Responsibility completed a review, and they concluded in a comprehensive 2009 report that Mr. Yu committed what they said was intentional professional misconduct when he knowingly failed to provide a thorough, objective, and candid interpretation of the law. It actually recommended a referral to the Pennsylvania Bar for disciplinary action that could have included being disbarred. Now, that sounds very serious. What, what happened there? Well, in this case, ultimately, the Department of Justice concluded that the report findings did not meet the specific technical standards required to prove violation of the rules of professional responsibility, the rules that were set by the Office of Legal Counsel, and then also the District of Columbia Bar Association and the Pennsylvania Bar Association. So was he vindicated, or what, did he get off on a technicality? Well, I wouldn't say that he was vindicated. In fact, to to better understand the details of this complicated case, I actually went back and did a little homework. I I read the 60-page report that reviewed the findings of professional misconduct. And in that report, Mr. Yu's legal opinion was characterized as flawed with more than minor errors. It found that his loyalty to ideology and convictions clouded his view of his obligations to his client, and it actually led to opinions that reflected his own extreme views of executive power. You know, the report said that Yu's legal opinions overstated the certainty of conclusions and exhibited poor judgment. Despite the fact that the report did not recommend disbarment, it did conclude that Yu's memos represented a, a truly unfortunate chapter in the history of the Office of Legal Counsel. I wouldn't exactly say that that was a professional endorsement. Yeah, but I I think we have to make it clear that in the end, it did not recommend disbarment. No, you're absolutely correct. It it left that decision to the individual bar associations, and, and they chose not to take action at that time. But it's interesting to note that that was not the only legal venue in which which Mr. Yu has had to defend his actions and his professional responsibility. Uh, There's a couple of interesting cases. One in 2006, a case was filed in Germany, which has uh, an op, which allows universal uh, jurisdiction, which means you don't have to be a German citizen to file the claim. But that case alleged human rights violations and torture against Mr. Yu and 13 others. And in 2009, a Spanish court launched a similar investigation of Mr. Yu and five others for war crimes. Yeah, even as recently as 2013, the Russian Federation banned Mr. Yu and several others from entering the country because of alleged human rights violations and for the what they claimed was the legalization of torture and the unlimited detention policy. Uh, you may recall, and we talked about this past December, when the Senate Intelligence Committee report on the CIA torture was released, uh, Dean Chemerinsky from the University of California, Irvine, called for Mr. Yu to be prosecuted for his role in authoring the torture memos. So I guess there's still a legal cloud hanging over Mr. Yu, but I wonder if it was so much his legal opinions or it was what resulted from those legal opinions. What's your view? Well, that's a a good question, and and many of these reports looked at that. The the real question is, did, did he anticipate the ultimate results from the opinions that he wrote? So I think it's fairly cloudy. It's it's both the opinion and the allegations that it was clear what was going to be done with these opinions and ultimately was done. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really part of both. Mm -hmm. Well, Mitch, that is all the time that we have today. But thank you for stopping by the program and helping us better understand the some of the liabilities associated with government lawyers who have to advise the president. I, I'm not sure I'd want that job. <laughs> it's definitely a challenging job with a lot of responsibility. You so bet. You really, you. you really have to look down the road at what your legal opinions are and what the uh, long-term repercussions might be as we're continuing to talk about them today. Uh, we'll see you back here again next week. Thank you, Rebecca. This is Mitch Winnick reminding you that when it comes to the law, A little knowledge is not a dangerous thing.
And that is our program for this week. If you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with John Yu, Mitchell Winnick, or Luis Alvarez, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. And if you joined our broadcast late or missed the interview with you, remember you can always download episodes of the Costa Report from our website, Apple iTunes, Podbean, and our YouTube channel. And be sure to check out our new radio blog, which is posted every week on our webpage. Uh, the blog captures the headlines from our interviews each week. So take a moment and check it out. And while you're there, be sure to register so you automatically receive our monthly newsletter where upcoming guests for the month are always announced in advance, along with new videos and news stories that only the Costa Report is covering. My guest next week is former congressman from Ohio, Mr. Dennis Kucinich, who claims Americans must take back the monetary system and also our right to privacy. But how does he propose we do that? Find out when Dennis Kucinich joins us next week on the only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. Again, I want to thank my first hour guest, John Yu, uh, as well as my roundtable colleagues, Sam Quentin and Bill Graff, for a feisty discussion in the second hour as well. And I'd like to thank you, the listener, for tuning in every week to uh, catch the news that the mainstream media sees fit to overlook. Until next week, I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for this edition of the Costa Report. Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries. Dole has a bounty of berries ripe for the picking. Fresh berries are not only delicious, but some of the most powerful disease-fighting foods available. Researchers have found that berries have some of the highest antioxidant levels of any fresh fruits. So add a handful or two of your favorite berries to your next meal and enjoy their nutritional benefits and natural sweetness in all of your dishes, from salads to desserts and everything in between. For fresh tips and ideas from Dole's berry experts, visit berries.dole.com. And be sure to check out the pages of mouthwatering recipes. Whether it's a sweet and savory blueberry cranberry chicken salad or a simple strawberry sorbet, Dole has the perfect berry to inspire your next berrylicious dish. They say you'll never get a second chance to make a good first impression. Hello, I'm Lisa Sabini from Floors Etc. in Soquel. Floors Etc. will help you make a good first impression at your home or business with our incredible selection of carpet, vinyl, hardwood, linoleum, and window coverings. Listen. Hi, I'm Jack Crawford with Music Now DJs. My job is to provide music and entertainment for weddings, corporate, and special events. I'm a professional, so when it comes to my floors, I've been calling on the professionals at Floors Etc. for over 15 years. They're reliable, they're efficient, and their prices are always reasonable. Floors Etc. will help you make a good first impression at your home or business with our incredible selection of carpet, vinyl, hardwood, linoleum, and window coverings. Stop by Floors Etc.'s beautiful showroom and get to know us. When you need to make a good first impression, start at Floors Etc. 3155 Porter Street, SoCal, 462-5586. Surfing Northern California for over 65 years. This is KSCO Santa Cruz.